Wonderful. So let me all welcome you, uh, dear guests, to our conference, to the conference of the Hungarian Europe uh, Society. Well, when we initiated this project and uh, started to implement uh, this conference and invited our guest speakers, we wanted to focus on two, in our perception, two supplementary issues, uh, political issues, namely, <clears throat> namely the debate on the future of Europe, the future of the European Union, especially the conference on the future of the European Union that will be completed by the 9th of May this year, and the Summit for Democracy, which is a flagship project of the Biden presidency in the United States and certainly for the global, uh, for the world as well. Well, beyond the salient events, uh, our original concept was to include all sorts of relevant and relatively broad themes to discuss, like the future of the international liberal order, the future of our Central European region, the ongoing fight by Democrats and liberals against populism and illiberalism, the changing role of the old and new media, uh, in a different political and media systems, uh, political discourse used by uh, populists and so on and so on, a lot of important issues. Certainly we will discuss all of them, all of these topics and some more during the day. But uh, what I want to emphasize, and you all know that since uh, the 24th of February, uh, we live in a different world the brutal military aggression of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, against uh, a neighboring country, Ukraine, has changed how we look at the, global, at the global political arena and the future of democracy today. On the one hand, our world has become much more dangerous and many lost their illusions that uh, war would be impossible in Europe in the 21st century. But on the other hand, the heroic resistance of the Ukrainian people help us not losing our democratic liberal beliefs and our faith in our shared universal values. Certainly Ukrainians fight for their own freedom and sovereignty, but they also fight against the partition of our globe into interest spheres of great powers and new empires moving back the world to the reality of previous times, which ended up with catastrophic consequences. I think that the definite reaction of the Western world also makes us more optimistic in the longer run. Even if in my own country, the Hungarian prime minister talked just two days ago at his election rally at our national day about his assumed smart strategy that means remaining neutral in the conflict between two foreign countries. I would say he made this statement from a highly provincial and a morally unjustifiable perspective. Well, this year we will face important national elections and one of them will be the Hungarian one, the Hungarian elections on the 3rd of April, 2022. Some years ago, political actors and observers in Europe and beyond would have not paid too much attention to our domestic party competition. But now, and not only because of the well-known special Putin-Orban friendship, the significance of our elections cannot be exaggerated. As I just read in Foreign Policy three days ago, from his early days as an anti-communist activist to his current incarnation as a global illiberal icon. End of quote. The success or failure of Orban will be followed and its impact analyzed worldwide. I'm going to talk about the Hungarian case at the end of our conference, not now. I just would like now uh, to welcome our guest speakers who will elaborate their own views about their own topics in about 15 minutes in three sessions, one in the morning and two in the afternoon. Once again, Putin has peculiarly influenced our conference agenda. 
I'm sure our speakers are ready to take this challenge. I would like to thank all of them, all of you, for accepting our invitation. Now, first, I will give the floor to Detmar Döring, head of Prague office of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. This event has been supported by the Naumann Stiftung as many previous events uh, in the past. I would like to thank Herr Döring and his colleagues for their generous contribution to this conference. Dear Mr. Döring, we are waiting for your welcome speech. Thank you for joining us. Well, I have to say thank you for allowing us to be partner in this venture. And uh, I think uh, when we started to plan all this, uh, we didn't realize that the Ukraine was about to be invaded so soon. But I think it makes it only more urgent. Maybe we have been prescient in some way because the topic is more urgent than ever before. First of all, because of course, uh, the invasion of the Ukraine is a genuine setback for the liberal order. And we will see in the Ukraine the consequences of what happens if uh, liberalism becomes successful somehow? I hope we will not really see it. I hope that the Ukraine may be spared from this fate, but we don't know. Anyway, it's something uh, terrible and it's appalling to see what uh, Putin's regime is capable of doing. On the other hand, uh, makes clear that this was also the product of weakness of the West. We could not stop this. And uh, yes, we see tendencies that, uh, let's say, the Western community of free societies is more ready to uh, make common efforts. The EU is doing things. Germany is doing, they are, is doing things uh, that we thought were not possible before. Uh, the US is really back on the transatlantic scene. That's all very positive. But there are underlying dangerous tendencies uh, where we can see, uh, how, where we can see, ask our, us the question well, how sustainable all this is. Uh, we see a problematic financial situation of Western democracies. We obviously can't really cope with the debt problem. Every solution to the problem of the EU has afterwards brought us into a deeper morass. Uh, Italy, for instance, is much more indebted than it was before we tried to rescue them. Uh, we have COVID weakened our economy. Uh, we have aging societies, especially in the industrial world. So uh, we really have to have an effort to reform and strengthen uh, the Western international communities. And that's why it is ever more important uh, uh, what we see as an idea behind Biden's, uh, President Biden's uh, effort to uh, find something like a community of democracies. We have to elaborate uh, on this, but something like this works only if there is some basis for it, if there is a kind of yeah, ideological superstructure, a Marxist would uh, say that, in other words, civil society is somehow functioning and internationalizing it, but also aware uh, of the problems that they are facing. And sometimes we have been perhaps too unrealistic. We thought there is something mythical uh, rule-based international order that does exist without real politics, for instance, especially in Germany, where I originally come from, uh, defense policy was really the bad stepchild where you better not speak about it, but we have to speak about it again. So it's important what we will all discuss here. And uh, I hope we will see more discussions all around the globe. And again, we are so happy that we can support this because we know uh, that you always deliver good quality in this. And I see a array of excellent experts. So uh, all I can say is that I wish you a very successful, intellectually stimulating uh, Zoom conference and great success. 
Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and especially for your good wish. And uh, yes, I think that we have excellent speakers for for the whole day. We try to bring together uh, scholars, experts, uh, NGO representatives, uh, and uh, and others. And I think in the audience we have many uh, citizens who are interested in in politics, not only because our, the recent events in, in Ukraine, but in, in general. And uh, I think it's very important to, to realize how Germany and maybe some other member states of the European Union have changed their position, realizing what's going on. Actually, many, many experts, uh, scholars have already try to explain how dangerous the Putin regime uh, is for peace and for stability. And we live in a different uh, world than, than uh, in the 90s, uh, as we all uh, uh, like to remember those, those years as a sort of uh, uh, period when everything has changed after the collapse of uh, communism in, in, in our region. I think uh, many speakers will touch upon these issues, but uh, we will focus on uh, on, on uh, the, the general agenda from, from different uh, perspectives uh, and aspects. And uh, I, I would suggest uh, to all of you to start, although uh, we, we, we still have some more time for the first uh, session, which should be started in three minutes, but I, I think we shouldn't wait and I, and I am going to stop speaking uh, uh, in, in that manner uh, in a minute. Just would like to, to uh, mention that the first session uh, will focus on, on the European Union, the, not only the conference on the future of Europe, of the future of the European Union, but in a more uh, broader sense on the future of our continent as part of the uh, assumed liberal order of uh, 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 globally. Uh, here we have four speakers now, and uh, I will introduce them when they are going to speak one by one, not uh, right now, because then you would forget in a half an hour or in an hour who, who are going to speak now. So what I'm going to do now is, is just mentioning that uh, this morning session, which has the title, the European Union fast forward or a new sclerosis will be started by the, uh, by the uh, address of uh, Jacques Rupnik, who is uh, an old friend actually, and we have cooperated for, for many years and we know each other for I think more than 30 years, unfortunately, for both of us, but we know each other and I'm very glad that you Jacques uh, accepted our invitation. For those who do not know you, you are certainly an expert on, on Central Europe. You, you speak uh, Czech and you have a strong uh, personal relationship uh, to, to this region as well. And that is why we, I think that your talk, which is uh, also about the, the so-called uh, uh, dividing lines inside the European Union, whether there is a cleavage between the East and West will be so important to discuss, especially in the shadow of the current uh, experience we have uh, because of, again, Vladimir Putin's brutal action against Ukraine. But I think you will also speak a little bit about uh, the French situation because you come from France and we will have another election uh, in April, not, not only a Hungarian one, but the French one, which is of course as important as, or maybe even more important uh, from a broader perspective than the, the Hungarian elections. So uh, Jacques, I don't want to talk more, please go ahead, the floor is yours. And after 15 minutes, I will show you a sign that maybe we should give floor for a discussion as well in another 14 and 15 minutes. So the floor is yours and thank you for being with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this event, for inviting me to, uh, to speak. I've been involved in trying to explain East Central Europe 
to West Europeans and the other way around for longer than I want to remember. So when you ask me to say, you know, uh, uh, your question was, do we have an East-West divide in Europe? Uh, and then you said uh, that I should do it from the, uh, including it, the dimension, uh, the discussion about the future of Europe. Well, uh, obviously, what's happening right now in Ukraine is reshaping all the issues, not just as has just been said, the post-89 era being over the international order, etc. But it also shifts completely the debate. So a month ago to your question, I would have said, yes, we have a divide or rather divides on certain uh, issues uh, of uneven importance uh, uh, between these more recent members of the EU from East Central Europe and, and, and some of the older members. And uh, I would have probably also stressed that uh, we should not, uh, that this is very serious because the question of democracy and rule of law is being posed, but we should not uh, just treat it as a specifically East Central European problem because it's a trans-European problem. Uh, 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 look at the look at the attempts at building alliances between uh, uh, people like Orban and uh, uh, Kaczynski, Morawiecki, and Salvini, Le Pen, etc. So there is an attempt to recast the European game. I would have said, I would have spoken about something uh, like that. And, uh, uh, and certainly I would have, uh, in dealing with the future of Europe, I would have certainly st started with the uh, quote from Viktor Orban in 1989. This is 2018 when he said, in 1989, we thought Europe was our future. Today we know we are the future of Europe, okay? So that, that would have been my entry into the subject uh, uh, a month ago. Uh, uh, this, uh, the subject and the divides have not disappeared, simply uh, um, the dividing lines are shifting and some issues are being sort of reconsidered, refocused, and the, the war uh, clearly, um, uh, uh, needs us to uh, uh, redefine or to, uh, let's say rethink uh, uh, the issue. When you have when you have Putin trying to define the war uh, in Ukraine that he's waging as the follow up to the Great Patriotic War. So this is follow up to uh, you know we are in 19, from 1942 to 2022. Okay, so this is and and you are in in an effort to denazify. Uh, 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 Ukraine. So this is uh, when you have when you hear something like that, <laughs> when you also hear that they feel that they are threatened uh, by Ukraine and possible Ukrainian application to NATO, uh, you can either just simply you know shrug and say this is cheap. but it may be more interesting to ref to try to think about the conflicts in terms of. Uh, precisely the, the dividing lines on the European continent between democracy and dictatorship. This is the crucial issue of our time. And uh, in a way, uh, Putin has brought this into uh, ever uh, sharper uh, focus. So that if I go back to what you had asked me, that is the uh, East-West divides, I will I'll, I'll, I'll have to have bear, bear that at the back of my mind all the time. Otherwise, it would look as I'm discussing secondary issues or the kind of uh, lessons in botanics in a cemetery. You know, so so uh, 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 if I take these uh, dividing lines, I will not list them all. But let's say three important ones of of, of the recent period. One concern, obviously. Uh, the whole question of rule of law and liberal uh, democracy, the separation of powers, independence of media, etc. There are lots of people, <laughs> I see the names, who know about this. I need not to spell it 
in uh, great details. I would simply say that, yeah, it was considered a marginal problem at the beginning when in two, uh, I think 2015 was a turning point when we had peace coming to power and Budapest in Warsaw. But we also had in Slovakia, Fico and uh, uh, Babish in the Czech Republic. This was kind of populism light, or if you want with Babish entrepreneurial populism. And they had a very uh, 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 distant uh, uh, attitude towards the European. So that, that was one uh, type of divide, this question about, um, about illiberal democracy, and this is a well-known uh, debate, raising all sorts of questions about how, f how much can EU tolerate within its own ranks. Number of authors were saying, we for the first time having an authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regime within the EU. What does it mean for the EU? Okay, so that was one kind of debate about uh, uh, that we had uh, within the EU. The second uh, dividing line came the same year, 2015, with the migrant crisis. And you remember the fans, et cetera, and the overt refusal by the Visegrad countries to uh, 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 engage in any sharing of the uh, migrants that were uh, arriving. And I'm not going now into the arguments about it, but the, oh, clearly the sovereignist argument was there and there was a cultural argument next to it. The third divide that came up in recent years, especially concerned what I would call societal liberalism. That is all the issues that range to uh, 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 from, um, <clears throat> Uh, from uh, abortion rights, gender, LGBT, all the way to multiculturalism. Anyway, all that is considered as societal liberalism, which is being denounced by uh, the uh, uh, prevailing conservative, uh, 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 not just politicians, the thinkers. I mean, there's a whole range of in very interesting thinkers, especially in Poland, Legutko, uh, 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 Krasnodebsky, there's a whole range of them. And interestingly, Legutko, you know, calls this, this is the new, to, you know, his book is called The Totalitarian Temptation. So this is the new totalitarian threat is liberal democracy, uh, is, is liberalism, because it is trying to dismantle the family, the nation and the church. These are the pillars of our society. And if you look at this kind of anti-liberal uh, criticism, uh, criticism is a mild word, it has echoes of the kind of stuff you hear from, uh, from Putin and from his ideologues. If you read Dugin, et cetera, they have the same view. The permissive decadent uh, uh, West is uh, 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 dissolving the family, the nation, the tradition, et cetera, et cetera, and the church above all. And, and, and so you have curiously <laughs> uh, this at least convergence, curious convergence with uh, the Eastern. So uh, that, that is uh, the uh, situation that we had. And the divide was clear when Kaczynski and Orban met in Krynica and said, we need a counter-revolution in Europe. Well, <laughs> that, was, that was their project. OK, now with the war, uh, with the war in Ukraine, all these issues come into a different focus. First of all, the ongoing debate about the rule of law, the kind of uh, way to cope with illiberal practices and uh, uh, in uh, some Central European countries, namely Hungary and Poland, but not, uh, not exclusively, uh, suddenly has been you know, put on a back burner. I'm not saying they're going away, by no means, but let's say they are less obviously in the focus uh, because there is emphasis on the need to act in unity and uh, unity to adopt sanctions, unity to respond uh, uh, to, uh, to a security threat and, uh, and, to, uh, and to war. So uh, when what you see is when you see the three prime ministers of Central Europe going, incidentally, not Visegrad, it's Polish, Czech, and Slovenian, uh, not, not Viktor Orban going there, uh, um, uh, going, going to, uh, to Kiev, you know, the Czech prime minister, Mr. Fiala says, I am bringing you a message of solidarity on behalf of Europe. 
So it's not, we are not doing something against Europe. We, we are going here to push Europe in a direction that we think is very good. So we are going there on, on behalf of uh, Europe. And suddenly the discussions we had before is the main, are security threats uh, 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 from, uh, from East being underestimated or are security threats from the South being underestimated when states were collapsing from Syria to Libya with refugee waves and, and terrorist attacks. That was the, the, uh, uh, 10 years ago, let's say, uh, uh, or, or uh, yeah, 2015 and that, that, that period. Now we have, suddenly there is greater unification, I would say, in Europe overcoming the divide on the security uh, 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 threats, sec threat perceptions. And if you're building, building that, uh, you'd have then a better perspective into trying to find convergence in creating a common security culture and common security responses. So suddenly the debate about, can Europe be a secure actor in the field of security and defense? In the face of what we're seeing, the answer is obviously it must be those who thought uh, uh, it must be. Should it be uh, the, the teleological debate? Is it is it Europe uh, or NATO? No, it's European dimension within NATO. So suddenly, all these debates that existed before are being shifted. There's only one framework, and that is NATO. And within that framework, the Europeans suddenly have to take their uh, 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 fate into their own hands because no, nobody will be always there to fix it for them. So that is an interesting shift. Sometimes we had this divide in Eastern Europe. You know don't do anything about European security because that would undermine NATO. <laughs> that, that, is not, that is not the point. Everybody within NATO, all Europeans have decided to take the sanctions, et cetera, and to provide uh, 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 military support to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, on the migration issue, which was the second point which uh, created the divide, you have complete reversal in East Central Europe. This is spectacular. I mean, this is when I'm, I'm being a lot of asked uh, on, on French radio, television, this is the first question they ask me, you know, how come, you know, in 2015, they said, we don't want a single <laughs> migrant settling here. I mean, you know, Fitzos statement, I don't want a single Muslim coming into this country. Anyway, they would be unhappy here because we don't have any mosques. So <laughs> that kind of statement <laughs> in an election, uh, pre-election campaign, well, suddenly, these countries are opening their doors, welcoming, doing a fantastic uh, 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 job in, in absorbing you know, 3 million refugees within three weeks. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal, effort. but it is not, uh, so this is a reversal in their attitude towards taking migrants. I will not speculate about the contrast and the motives that uh, may come up in the discussion. But what is interesting is that suddenly the discussion, the idea that Europe should be taking part in handling that humanitarian effort, in, in trying to share the distribution of refugees in the future. Are you showing me the, the, the time? Have I, uh, am, am I doing okay? Okay, I'm, usually when I run out of time, I, sp I, I speak even faster so that that may not be a good, uh, that may not be a good uh, idea. But anyway, uh, you, uh, you have about two or three minutes actually. Three, yes. Okay. So, yeah. so I will come to the uh, to, uh, to to conclude to conclusion first. So this is a reversal, not just for Poland and Hungary, for the Czechs, for 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 for, for Slovaks, for for many others. Welcoming refugees, doing fantastic job. Civil society mobilized on that behalf, and the European framework. Suddenly, they all saying we will have to think not just about European funding for all this but also European way of distribution. I mean, they already uh, 15,000 have arrived to France. They arrived from Poland. And anyway, this is, this is a all European effort. And suddenly uh, it's a complete reversal of 2015. So the, the divide we had in 2015 <laughs> is, no, is no longer there. And, and uh, as I said, in the discussion, we can uh, maybe come to the question about how come there is such a contrast. And the third, uh, uh, issue I wanted to, to, to mention is in the recent confrontations 
between, uh, let's say, Budapest and Warsaw, to cut a longer story short, and, uh, and the European uh, Commission on the question of the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. You have followed all these issues. The tone that was used was vociferous and very confrontational. I, I, I invite you to read uh, 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 Prime Minister Morawiecki's uh, interview in Financial Times when he compared the EU's effort uh, to uh, impose conditionality on rule of law to starting Third World War. Wow. Uh, uh, when you read uh, or when you hear uh, Judith Varga, Minister of, uh, of Justice in Hungary, when you read Jobro, Minister of Justice in Poland, when you hear them comparing, not once and not uh, 10 years ago, several times, only six months ago, <laughs> when you hear them comparing Brussels is the new Moscow, European Union is treating like Soviet Union. And then you shift to Vladimir Zelensky speaking live to European Parliament at the beginning of March, not long, addressing European Parliament and saying, we want to join this horrible thing that has just been denounced. We want to join the European Union because for us, this is the democracy. This is the anchor for our democratic endeavor in the face of an aggression by a dictatorship of Vladimir Putin in, on, in Russia. So suddenly this whole preposterous rhetoric, I mean, preposterous, I don't know whether the, 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 in Central Europe it is sufficiently measured how insulting this is. How it is felt as an insult when things like that are being said by people who have so for 70 years tried to commit themselves to building something like the European Union. It is deeply insulting. It is preposterous. And then when you hear Zelensky <laughs> saying, you know, I, he knows a thing or two about, you know, the clarification of the issue, European democracy or Russian autocracy. This is what is at stake in this war. And that suddenly will clarify or dilute or transform the kind of divides I have just been talking about, the, uh, 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 the rhetoric that has been used. There is, there is nothing, this is my last sentence, there is nothing like having Russian tanks at your doorstep to concentrate the minds. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Uh, thank you, Jacques. I, I would suggest uh, to, to all the participants to, to send me a message uh, in, uh, because I cannot see all of you at the same time. And meanwhile, I would raise uh, the first question to, to Jacques. I, I wouldn't comment what, uh, what you were saying. I have many ideas in my mind, but uh, it's, it's now, it's your time uh, for this 30 minutes. But what I would like to ask you when you refer to this changing perception, how the European dimension of NATO cannot be question marked anymore, then that this debate, whether we need on behalf or in the name of European sovereignty, something very special, not connected to NATO, a European defense structure without NATO. Maybe this debate has shifted, as you mentioned also, to a more common uh, uh, view that the European dimension of, uh, of security is part of NATO. Is this view now common in France? Uh, you are facing the European elections, and I know that those who have supported Putin, like Marine, like Marine Le Pen previously, also changed a little bit maybe her rhetoric. Please explain to us what's going on and whether this idea that, that uh, European dimension in security matters uh, inside NATO, is it now acceptable for the whole French political elite or there will be a special French attitude to this question in the future as well? Well, there's always been 
an internal debate in France between those who wanted more Europe and those who wanted to do a more sort of traditionally Gaullist position, etc. And uh, there was a long conversion on the left uh, um, uh, to NATO because they saw left uh, as associated too much with US and US in the old days was associated with war in Vietnam and various other things. So there was, there was a tradition on the left that was, but that, 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 that has been completely overcome. And I think that what is interesting is that uh, 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 this issue that Macron, uh, uh, what he brought into French politics. He is the first politician in France who ran his campaign on an overtly unabashedly pro-European ticket. So you had various people, they were not necessarily anti-European, but they were moderately anti-pro-European, uh, et cetera, focusing on, he ran on an exclusively pro-European in 2017. That was a brave endeavor and not because of that, but because of other circumstances, he succeeded. So this was like, you thought this was like a flu. But he then continued. In the first year, he made four speeches about Europe, which is a kind of European program where he talked, especially the Sorbonne speech, but he made four others. That the, this idea of European uh, 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 sovereignty or Europe, that the European strategic, and this might have been misunderstood by some and trying to do something outside of NATO. Uh, no, that it, there was simply the reckoning that under Trump, Trump is a wake up call that at, who, uh, American president who at least on three occasions overtly questioned the relevance of NATO. So you suddenly have to listen to that. Uh, you, uh, uh, you also hear the Americans saying they had a pivot to Asia. Atlantic Alliance is not the exclusive preoccupation. In fact, the main preoccupation is China and the Pacific. You have to listen to that as a European. And finally, you see the debacle in Kabul, the, the, the rush of Kabul, and, and you say, well, uh, uh, NATO is the framework, uh, the Atlantic Alliance is the political framework, but the Europeans have to make sure <laughs> that it uh, retains uh, its uh, 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 function, keeping the alliance with the Americans, but you cannot rely only exclusively, somebody else will fix it for us. And this kind of attitude that was inherited during the Cold War, it was easy. There was always somebody else, the United States who was the ultimate guarantor. And the United States is, is here, it's indispensable but cannot be relied on everything. So that is very important. And that is, I think, this debate about what did Macron had in his mind? Well, uh, I think that has nobody, at, at no point Macron during this debate or any the foreign minister have questioned the uh, primacy of doing all this European dimension, Europe as an actor within NATO within the Atlantic Alliance. And suddenly the Putinesque far right, you know, the people who, when I say Marine Le Pen uh, 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 meeting with Orban and with Morawiecki, Morawiecki hosted a dinner for Marine Le Pen, what, in November? It's not so long ago. In the midst of a French election campaign, <laughs> the Polish prime minister hosted a dinner for uh, 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 for uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, who happens to be very uh, sympathetic uh, to some of Putin's theses, and who even gets got a loan for her election campaign from a Russian bank. So uh, 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 via Hungary, incidentally, it's a, it's a branch that is established in, in Budapest. So uh, uh, suddenly, and Zemmour, who is another far right candidate who had a soft spot for Putin. And on the, on the, on the left, uh, uh, there is also a, one candidate, uh, Mélenchon, who also always prepared to give the benefit of the doubt to, 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 to put. All this has suddenly been deflated. They are, they are not, they're trying to backtrack or, or dilute what they were saying, and they are inaudible on that. So they, they, they want to talk about something else. Let's talk about migration again. That was a great topic. Let's talk about you know, culture wars or something. And people say, listen, it's all very interesting, but we have, we have other crucial issues. So that is, 
yeah, a sobering moment, I would say, uh, for French politics as well, actually, uh, um, and uh, not just for uh, not just for Europe as a whole. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, actually. Some money was sent from a Hungarian bank, MKB, as well to Marine Le Pen. So, the, you know, this triangle or even bigger cooperation amongst uh, populi populist uh, right wingers uh, was broader. But okay, I think we have time only for one short question now. I uh, I don't see anybody's hands, and maybe it's better to use Erin. Now I can see you. Please go ahead, unmute yourself. Hi, um, Jacques. I'm so happy to have a chance to talk to you. My name is Erin Jenny. I'm a professor of international relations at Central European University, and I have American citizenship and now also Hungarian. So I'm literally a dual type of person, Europe, transatlantic. I was wondering if you could comment on the situation in Bosnia and now even Kosovo. I was at a conference last week in Belgrade and this, the mood there was, let's say different, right? From what you typically now see in most European capitals, there was a pro Putin protest there. Um, Aeroflot is still running flights. Um, and now you're starting to see also talk about possibly revisiting the Kosovo issue. And, you know, to speak of, you know, going back to your earlier point about NATO, right? This NATO pivot to the East has been ongoing for decades now, right? I mean, this is a decision that was made by Washington that, you know, jointly with their EU partners, that the EU is going to basically take over all of the peacekeeping, all of the state building, um, civil society building operations in Bosnia, um, less so in Kosovo, but still this is kind of on the agenda. So, but it seems, it seems like this is now maybe slipping away from the EU, even, even this situation, right? With all the focus on Ukraine, it seems that, you know, the eye is maybe being taken off other issues in the Balkans. So I'm wondering what you would say to that more generally. Okay, thank, thank you, Erin. Uh, there was another question. Maybe you have seen it, uh, Jacques, about Macron's position. If not, uh, I, I don't see who was it, but uh, could you please uh, raise your hand uh, again and? Uh, and ask the question, uh, Jacques, I cannot hear you, but okay, then Jacques, please go ahead with, with your answer to, to yeah, Erin. Maybe you can, maybe you can then read me the, the other question. I mean, don't get me started on the, on the whole Balkan question. I was involved with, with the International Commission on the Balkans and then with the Commission on Kosovo. Both issues, this was in the 90s, right? <laughs> Both issues are still with us. So um, uh, we, there was military intervention followed by in international protectorate, which became Europeanized protectorate. And uh, that was seen as the exit strategy uh, for, uh, for the military aspect, for, 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 for NATO uh, uh, presence, but it was also seen as a way of dealing with stabilizing the region and eventually giving it some perspective. The, um, and there were a lot of parallels one could make between the breakup of Yugoslavia and the breakup of uh, the Soviet Union. And to cut a long story short, uh, you know, the big difference, there was no war in the USSR because Yeltsin was not Milosevic. Yeltsin was in fact pushing for the dissolution of the Soviet Union because he was <laughs> running as a Russian president elected against uh, Gorbachev, who was uh, uh, the embodiment of the, he was the leader of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So, but Putin is in a way in Milosevic footsteps. So you can, you can make parallel there. If we cannot have uh, Yugoslavia, let's have greater Serbia. If you cannot have USSR, let's have greater Russia, some form of empire restore. So you can ha have parallels uh, there. And uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Bosnia and Kosovo, both for different reasons are not in 
uh, uh, great shape. The most worrying, uh, I, I know we don't have much time, but the most worrying, I would say, is Bosnia, uh, uh, simply because it, it remains as divided uh, as it was. And in fact, uh, 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 when you see how Dodik, the, the Bosnian Serb leader, had first welcomed the annexation uh, of Crimea in 2014, and he is a kind of supporter of what Putin is doing, because he has at the back of his mind that this is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, just, as, just as Putin says, uh, 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 what I did in Crimea is uh, 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 basically what you did, you the West have done in Kosovo, you have detached a territory uh, from Serbia, you have detached Kosovo from Serbia by military might, I'm doing the same. And Dodik is seeing something similar. If we can reattach, or, or not reattach, attach uh, uh, Republika Srpska, part of Bosnia, to, uh, to Serbia. And uh, here, the European Union has a crucial role to play because the Russians clearly are will be encouraging something like that. anything that can bring instability and enhance Russian influence in the Balkans is there. And they have influence through the energy sector. Uh, they have influence through uh, politics, uh, 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 their connections. And when you see, when you see that the Serbian uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Vucic said, you know, I will not, uh, I will condemn the Russian uh, intervention in Ukraine when you condemn the, uh, uh, the American bombing of uh, uh, the, U uh, the NATO bombing of Belgrade. Okay, so you, you can see the kind of politics that are being uh, now played. But yeah, I would say for the European Union, don't, uh, don't forget you have uh, Bosnia as, a, as a pro probably the weakest point in the Balkans this is where the war was the worst in the 90s. And this is probably where the risks are the biggest uh, today. And uh, I always say, you know, the EU is not great at intervening militarily. That's for NATO. What EU can do is before preventing. And it's very good at rebuilding after. <laughs> but so let's do it before it gets uh, uh, it gets to that point, and, okay. and it's a uh, just quickly the one yeah. the one yeah. the one card they can play on Serbia is EU accession, and people in Serbia really are not convinced that this is going to happen ultimately, and this is part of the reason that they're talking about revisiting the issue of Kosovo. Yeah, the whole yeah. question of enlargement to the Balkans will have to be rethought uh, in the context actually of what is going on in Ukraine. If we are talking about Ukraine getting a kind of opening, not just Ukraine, possibly Georgia, Moldova. So if you're doing that, you cannot at the same time ignore people to whom you've given that opening 20 years ago. So uh, that Balkan train of enlargement will have to get moving. And the, there are good ideas that are being floated. Of course, if you just say, well, we bring them in, and suddenly Montenegro will ask to have veto power on the policies of the EU, of Germany, France, and I don't know what, and people say, <laughs> we, we, that, that, that's not gonna happen. But you can have <coughs> uh, 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 something that is being discussed now, staged membership, uh, uh, a staged accession into the EU. There are steps uh, that you can take now so you have partial membership, associate membership, and at each stage, you have not only access to EU funds, but you have participation in some of the EU political uh, 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 process. I will not discuss it now. I know it's taking us away from, uh, 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 from other issues, but it is connected to the Ukrainian issue because it's the same thing. If you say to Ukrainians, your future is in Europe. We we, we respond to the call by Zelensky and, and I think uh, von der Leyen said something like that, you know, they are part of the family or they belong to us. And it has been repeated at this Versailles summit uh, in, in, in Paris, things like that. But and then everybody says, oh yeah, but however, you don't meet the criteria, the conditions, we have to think of something. Well, 
yeah, we have to rethink the enlarge enlargement. It's not going to be the same model as with Central Europeans. And if Ukraine forces us to rethink the enlargement process, my idea is political membership now, <laughs> and then you do a <laughs> number of other steps that have to be done to have full membership in all other respects. And if you do that for the Ukrainians, well, you are forced to do it for the Balkans. Okay, and so, um, yeah. yeah. The, the, the enlargement issue will be a crucial question. And the countries of Central Europe, incidentally, have a major role to play because they were until now great promoters of enlargement in the EU, but they themselves were uh, trashing the EU morning, lunchtime and dinner. You cannot like almost say, you know, EU is this terrible thing. You know, this is, uh, Brussels is like Moscow. It's horrible, etc. How dare they? Et and then the next thing say, it is so horrible that we wish to enlarge it to, to the Balkans. <laughs> it's just, it just, it just a non-starter. So now that the, as I said in my talk, the, uh, the Europhobic streak in the Central European discourse is being sidelined. We've heard uh, President Duda, you know, have new tone on Europe. Morawiecki as well. Everybody is, you know, suddenly uh, behaving differently. And suddenly that, that Central European voice pro enlargement in the Balkans will be heard and for good reasons. Jacques, uh, Jacques thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Erin and Jacques, bringing in the Balkans and enlargement into, into our debate. Uh, and that's why I thought that you should go on and uh, explaining your views because that's so important. And you were so right when mentioning if Ukraine, then also the countries of the Balkans should uh, join us and maybe political membership or a membership for citizens instead of states, that might be the first step. And that's about the future of Europe, what we are, what we have discussed until so far. Uh, there is one more question, but I'm not sure whether Johannes Alefeld really wants to ask his question because we are running out of time. Uh, uh, I don't want to delay you. I mean, the, 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 this, uh, I, it's okay. I, the, it's okay. Questions will, will, will come up in the next session, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I would suggest, if I'm sorry for uh, Johannes, to go on because we are running uh, out of time. And I would like to thank you, Jacques, for, for your contribution. And please stay with us as long as you can for, for the morning, at least. Thank you. Uh, so our, our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, someone whom I haven't met before, Lina Selle, the chairperson of the European Movement Germany from Berlin, of course. And uh, she, she already sent me some, some uh, articles and statements of what the, the European Movement Germany has published uh, recently. And I thought it would be very important to have a, a German position uh, on the changing European landscape. So I asked her to speak about the new German perceptions on the future of the European uh, Union. And again, uh, things have changed recently a, a lot because of Vladimir Putin. So, Lin, if you are ready to bring in Putin's invasion of Ukraine into your speech, it's also welcome. The floor is yours, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Lin. Yeah, uh, it is to me uh, to thank for, for the invitation. Uh, what a great crowd uh, to discuss with. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, and of course, I think uh, no intervention uh, these days can come without uh, mentioning um, the situation in Ukraine and Russia's war of aggression. So be uh, assured I will touch on that as well. But um, I would firstly lay a focus on yeah, the new or not so new uh, German government, um, which was uh, inaugurated in December. And um, yeah, just very recently, Annalena Baerbock, the new uh, foreign minister in Germany, um, she said, well, I'm only in office for three months, but it feels like three years. Um, and I think that touches or that describes very accurately the situation the, the new German government came into office. Um, they basically had to jump a running train and find itself today in the deepest foreign policy crisis in, well, decades or probably even since World War II. Um, 
Interestingly, this uh, government for the first time in German history is a three party government um, consisting of social democrats as um, well the chancellor uh, holding party and the liberals and greens. Um, and it was also the, the last uh, social democratic and green coalition in the late 1990s who actually had to find political answers to the Balkan wars. Um, so that was um, a very tough debate then. Uh, mostly within the Green Party, and uh, yeah, nowadays we find ourselves in a situation where again we have a um, war of aggression of a uh, well a different scale, um, unfortunately, um, where Greens and Social Democrats again share a government. Um, so I will um, touch on on three points: uh, the new uh, government, um, also briefly on the conference on the future of Europe, as both is rather um, entangled. And um, of course, the, the Russia's uh, war on Ukraine. Um, so when we look at the coalition agreement between the three parties I already mentioned, um, we see that there is a distinct new approach to EU policy. So what we hope at the moment, we can hope mostly, um, because it's been only roughly 100 days in office. Um, but what we see is that there's potentially a more proactive German government than previous ones. Um, so the government supports, openly supports treaty changes, a constitutional convention that can lead to further um, institutional reforms. Uh, it even mentions a European federal state, which is even for Germans, uh, German governments unheard of. So there's a new tone in EU policies. And of course, we still have to see to what way um, this is then translated into action. Um, but overall, also, if you look at the sectoral policies, we can see that German interests are very closely aligned with um, European interests. Um, so maybe to cite some um, uh, elements um, that the German government um, is citing in their agreement, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a bit of a cold. I, I hope uh, uh, I'm, you can hear me well. Um, so in its coalition um, agreement, uh, especially the commitment on the rule of law um, is considered a very important field. Uh, precondition for a successful, successful and credible foreign policy. And um, the new, new government promises to defend the rule of law both internally and externally. Um, and yeah, as well, the largest EU member state, um, they also openly say that they that Germany itself has a special responsibility in this regard. And this is noteworthy because um, well, I think those of you who are um, in, in Hungary might have noticed the past years that the last German government was rather, well, not so, so openly challenging um, attacks um, on the rule of law, especially in Hungary. Um, so um, the government calls upon the European Commission to further develop and utilize existing rule of law instruments and uh, also supports the application of the rule of law mechanism with um, yeah, the current ECJ ruling, we might be um, well waiting for um, uh, the things to come. So um, I think this is really a change of tone compared to last uh, governments. Um, but of course, we have to see to what extent this is then really applied also given the current uh, well broader geopolitical situation. Um, Jack already talked about with the war in Ukraine maybe overshadowing some internal um, reform issues. Um, so overall, um, we at the European Movement Germany, maybe one word on our organization, we're a organization of organizations. So our members are trade unions, um, companies, but also environmental organizations, youth organizations, so very the breadth of um, organized society in Germany. Um, and we have, as, as our, our members in my organization, we have very high expectations of this government. Um, of course, it's only 100 days, but we really do hope that um, there will be a positive balance on a proactive European uh, policies, <coughs> especially when it comes to a more democratic European Union, also um, European Parliament's right of initiative. Um, and maybe also interestingly, for the first time, 
um, ever uh, the Green Party is in charge of the EU coordination within the government. So as the Greens hold both the Foreign Office and the Economics um, Ministry, they are the ones that coordinate how the German government positions itself on the European sphere. And this is interesting because it's both it's the Greens uh, who do that and for the first time well not well, for the first time since many years um, both ministries are in the same party hands um, so usually they're split um, also to have the coordination level between different parties um, and this might also be um, uh, interesting to see how this develops also how Germany will position itself on in, in Brussels. Um, yeah, maybe briefly on the conference on the future of Europe, I think, uh, or I know this will be touched upon by the next speaker, but I think um, to, to also make a bridge to, to Russia's war in Ukraine, I think what we all saw in the past weeks is that there's a necessity of a EU that is strong and capable to act. And in this respect, the conference provides an important platform to generate ideas on a future-proof Europe. Um, of course, not only in foreign and security policies, but also. And I think the conference in that respect can serve to initiate reforms that, that strengthen the EU from within, but also in its ability to act as an international actor um, for example, by reforming the unanimity voting in um, the Foreign Affairs Council. And um, yeah, I think it is a crucial precondition for the EU to play a major role in world politics if we have a proper institutional setup um, that enables this global role. And um, this has to be or has to be based on the European um, values. So um, I don't want to, to um, uh, go too much into detail on the conference, as I'm sure that will be touched upon by um, my next colleague. But um, we are very much looking forward what will um, happen in the next weeks. Um, we now have the citizens' recommendations that are very progressive, not in a party political way, but in a way to <coughs> foster progress on the European reform. So, for example, reinforce EU's rule of law instruments, having a coherent EU electoral system, better protection of human rights. Um, but now this will all go to the plenary and then um, recommendations are um, adopted. And um, I think from our perspective as European Movement Germany, it is crucial that real reforms are initiated, that this is not only a listening exercise, but that there will be a political outcome and a political reform, whatever it might be um, at, uh, at the end. And if we again look at the new German government, um, we also see new progress on the conference on the future of Europe, because for the first time, the last government was very much silent about what they want to achieve with the conference. But for the first time, um, the German government issued a non-paper in um, well this month um, in order to formulate their expectations, their political expectations um, for the conference. Uh, for example, a transparent procedures for the next steps of the conference, but also um, promises that Germany will participate intensively in this process <coughs> and also underlining well, their political demands, their political aims um, they, they want to achieve with the conference. Um, this is very positive. Um, as I said, the former government was not so proactive, um, but it remains to be seen um, to what extent the conference have a real impact. Um, we will certainly follow this um, closely. Um, Russia's war on Ukraine uh, has already uh, cover has already been been covered. Of course, this has also shaken, um, well, me personally as all of us here, um, but also my organization. Um, I think it's as I said, it shows that we need a coherent European response, shoulder to shoulder with NATO's. Um, but um, I was actually positively surprised how the EU27 initial response showed a determined, coordinated, shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder, um, response against Russia's aggression. And it is, of course, vital that this unity continues um, and is not hindered by diverging views amongst members um, 
um, on, on distinctive topics. Um, what we have uh, worked a lot on first is um, the question of EU enlargement, which has already been touched upon. Um, we are in favor of a swift enlargement um, for Ukraine. Well, swift is well, you, you can't have a swift enlargement because um, the process will take a lot of time, but um, to have a credible process now. And while at the same time, this is what um, uh, uh, Jack just, just said, uh, not forgetting the, the Western Balkan um, states in here. Um, second point we have been very active upon is um, the suspension and now um, um, out um, um, Oh, sorry, uh, the suspension of Russia from the Council of Europe, which is for us a very important institution, although it's sometimes a bit, um, uh, uh, well, not so much in the media, um, but for us, especially its role on rule of law, human rights, democracy is of crucial importance and there, um, the suspension of Russia is a very important sign um, and uh, something we have lobbied a lot on um, in the past, uh, past weeks. Um, so yeah, uh, to conclude, uh, after 100 days in office, it still remains to be seen, but we are still very positive that the new German government will be more proactive on the European stage, more um, uh, progressive uh, in on a European reform agenda. And um, yeah, of course, um, the situation in Ukraine will further be a litmus test for how um, strong and how united the European Union can be in foreign policies in these times and, and how they take on their responsibility for peace. Um, I think, um, well, the European Union as a peace project, I think this, um, well, will be um, very important how these next months will go. Again, thanks and look, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. That was great in spite of your of you being cold, having a cold, just like me actually, so I feel the sympathy to you and thanks for being with us in spite of uh, your your uh, bad feelings. Uh, and what you said, that's, uh, that's certainly very important for us uh, that the, the relatively new German government has such a, a, a clear uh, pro-European focus uh, in the last uh, 100 uh, days and, uh, and uh, in, in the coalition agreement as well. My question is a little bit uh, sort of uh, historic uh, argument, uh, whether you think that uh, what was so important in, uh, in the previous decades, a very special French-German relationship, what they called a uh, tandem, and the argument was that the two countries together somehow can influence and determine what's going on inside the European Union, whether this sort of old friendship can be maintained, even if we live in a different world, and I hope that smaller member states, uh, middle-sized member states uh, will have also an influence uh, and have an influence inside the uh, European uh, Union and in the decision making. But I think it's still important that uh, if Emmanuel Macron will be re-elected and you have now a new German government, what you think can they cooperate for the political and institutional reforms uh, that include civil society as well? You mentioned uh, before, so are you optimistic about uh, these sort of uh, dynamics uh, which might be played by the two governments uh, in the future. Lynn, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think so, um, that this will, of course, continue. Um, well, we have to wait for how the French um, presidential elections will turn out. But um, if Emmanuel Macron stays on, I think there will remain a very good dynamic. Also, you shouldn't underestimate that due to the Franco-German Friendship Treaty, um, there is a constant dialogue on all levels of government between France and Germany, um, which makes it easier to, to, to plan and, and to, to initiate um, debates. Um, but I think, and, and this is noteworthy because we at, at the European Movement Germany, we have always been, well, of course, we say uh, the Franco-German relationship is super important for also European reform, but you shouldn't, um, uh, uh, think that you need to have it in order to init initiate any reform because 
sometimes in the past decades, other uh, coalitions or other actors have been overlooked, especially uh, well in the central of Europe, um, also uh, Italy. And, and for that respect, I'm very positive again about this new German government that I think it was the, the second um, trip from Olaf Scholz to um, in his chancellorship to Italy, uh, visiting Mario Draghi. And I think this shows that Germ uh, that Europe isn't only France and Germany. And afterwards, right after the start of, of um, the war in Ukraine, he invited the Baltics. Um, there was a meeting in the Weimar Triangle format. So I, I really do hope that the new German government also um, understands the importance to have broader coalitions and also to include the well, smaller member states and their their ideas and their problems, um, not only in this situation with Ukraine, where, of course, um, the, the Central and Eastern European states are much closer to, to the scenery, but um, also in other issues of European reform, because what we've seen, for example, in the next generation EU debate um, uh, last year was that there was a, a proposal by France and Germany, and then they didn't coordinate very well with other member states. And then suddenly the Netherlands stood up and said, well, you didn't say anything to us. We, we, we don't want this. And I think it's important to, to have a much broader um, approach. And this is, again, the responsibility of Germany as being such a big uh, member state with this important bridge function between the, the uh, West and the East of the European Union. Yeah, thank you. And certainly I agree with you that uh, it's not only about France, but uh, all the other member states. And we don't have uh, Great Britain anymore. So uh, there is a different uh, balance now inside the European Union. And we have a very different uh, era, what we already discussed because of the war in our neighborhood, which is relatively close to Germany as well, actually. And, and I guess it uh, had an influence on the German perception uh, about security issues, as we already discussed. I think we have uh, time for one, maybe two questions, maybe one at least, if, but I don't see anybody's uh, hand uh, on my uh, screen. If you have any, any questions, uh, it would be more than welcome. Uh, if, if not at the moment, maybe I, I used my cell phone, which means that I don't see everything at, in the same time, which is my technical failure at this uh, conference. But uh, then I would like to ask you uh, another question. And that's exactly what, uh, what, what you already started with actually, that, uh, that the new German, relatively new German government uh, at a very special parliamentary session on a Sunday, which never happened before, uh, changed its mind. And actually, in a in a very open debate, I followed it on on uh, ZDF, uh, which was very striking for for me, a uh, Hungarian who who never watches any parliamentarian debates in Hungary because these are not intellectually very high level discussions. But the German debate was as traditionally as always a great debate uh, on security issues and, uh, and how much Germany should spend actually uh, on, on security for itself and for Europe, having in mind its special role, uh, historic role, Second World War, etc. So how, to make it short, how would you, Lynn, evaluate this shift? Is it now accepted uh, and acceptable for, for Germans in general or all political parties without IFD, I guess, that Germany would play a much more important role in the future uh, for Europe and for, for the globe as well. Please go ahead. Yeah, I was also surprised. Uh, well, well, not surprised, but but um, it was well conceived. Um, this parliamentary debate also, because once again, I think yeah. Well, you in in Hungary uh, might know it differently, but um, what a high level 
political debate also, especially between opposition and government took place because also the biggest opposition party, the, the Christian Democrats who have been in office with Angela Merkel for the past 14 years, they have been closing the ranks basically with the government and, and underlining how important it is in these times of course, while not neglecting their role as opposition party, but showing solidarity and showing their cooperation with the government in these times of crisis. And I think this is something that is remarkable, um, I think also for functioning democracy. Um, we'll see how that plays out in the next month, but for the moment, um, I think that was in a positive way, very remarkable. Um, the role of Germany in, in, in the future on security and foreign policy, I think this is still too easy to tell. Um, at the moment, um, we don't have a very big debate about this Zeitenwende, this shift of eras um, in German military policy. Um, but I think this will come. At the moment, it is very much overshadowed by um, what we do about Ukraine, how the German government is positioning itself. I wouldn't go as far in saying that this is a um, change of era with respect to Germany as a whole in the world, um, because I think the government is really underlying that this is our European affair in Ukraine, that we don't leave Ukraine alone, although I know there could be something could, or more could be done, of course. Um, but whether this will also translate to a broader, more proactive military role of Germany in the world, I think this really remains to be seen because um, although uh, the chancellor kind of pushed away all certainties of the past uh, uh, 40 years of Germany's foreign policy, um, of course, these peace projects or people who are strongly against military action, um, they still remain and it, it still remains to be seen. But I think in the broader public, the, the um, perception of NATO and that we have to have a deterrence, a role of deterrence also um, on the European continent, this has certainly shifted. Like we haven't talked about deterrence for 20 years in public and now we do. And um, I think it's an important shift. Also what we, we said earlier about um, the European pillar with the NATO, we don't know what's happening in the United States with the next elections, it is crucial that the Europeans get their act together, um, to say it bluntly, and um, that Germany, of course, again, um, as the biggest member state is playing a pivotal role here, again, as well as with France, with Poland. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That uh, was great. And uh, certainly the, the future, we don't know, but this shift, what the German government made, and maybe the German uh, political elite, at least, that's, that's very important and uh, for Europe and we will see how far it goes, as you said. Well, thank you very much, Lynn, for your contribution. It was Thanks very nice. Uh, and uh, I wish you good health. Uh, uh, you, you see, I'm, uh, I have the same problems like you, so let's uh, keep in touch in the future. Uh, please stay with us. And now I would like to welcome uh, our next speaker who is uh, another old partner of our Hungarian Europe Society, Wojciech uh, Przybilski. He already participated at previous events organized by our uh, Hungarian Europe Society. And Wojciech is, uh, is uh, managing a project which is uh, about uh, Central European views about the reforms of the European Union. And we already discussed it before, it's not a secret, that uh, maybe we should somehow propose a, a different alternative view to, uh, to our government's uh, positions uh, who pretend to represent uh, Central Europe as, a, as a such and, and, uh, and, uh, and presenting their illiberal and populist views and uh, very often anti-European and anti-Brussels uh, rhetoric. So I think uh, Wojtek, you are in the middle of this project now, and we haven't reached the end of the conference on the future of U the European Union either. But I, so I think it's the very right moment uh, now to discuss whether 
we can suggest anything for, for Europe from an alternative perspective. And my last sentence is once again about uh, Ukraine. Certainly everything has changed as we already discussed and whatever positions we would like to, to present as alternative views, we might see a very different word regarding the Orban Kaczynski relationship. Uh, the Polish government and the Polish opposition party have very different views compared to the Hungarian prime minister and Fidesz. So if you involve this topic into your presentation, that would be also very nice. But anyway, the floor is yours and thank you for coming, Wojtek. Thank you, thank, thank you, uh, Ishvan for uh, and Eric for uh, organizing this and inviting me. Uh, it's a really uh, great uh, opportunity to be among uh, such uh, great minds and you know colleagues and, and friends, uh, and to discuss the the perspective that is indeed missing, uh, the perspective uh, of Central Europeans in the conference on the future of Europe but in general, the discussion about future of Europe. I think um, I should first start by saying that, of course, in Visegrad Insights, the, the analytical and media platform that I lead, we our ambition is to bring more understanding, but also more voices, not, not only in the project that you just mentioned, it's a strategic foresight exercise, uh, but much beyond that through our all activity that's turned 10 years this year, a more understanding and more presence of Central European perspective uh, to colleagues across um, uh, Europe. It is essential because Europe whole and free is not complete if we do not have a good understanding and explanation of the um, positions uh, that sometimes uh, turn into very ridiculous ones, but oftentimes they're also simply not being debated and they're marginalized in the debates. Such was uh, a clear voice in 2011 by a foreign minister of Poland, uh, Radek Sikorski, when he went to Berlin to give this speech, which was not a speech in the name of Poland, but specifically because he was a Polish um, a politician uh, um, sitting in the office and he spoke of uh, the need of German strategic ability to, to be proactive in security and defense and to go beyond protecting internally uh, German democracy and to think broader of, uh, and to manifest that in the broader terms of European security. That was uh, a call that we haven't, we haven't been really debating that much, um, maybe un up until the end of the previous German government, uh, when these started to be um, picked up by AKK, uh, outgoing, um, uh, as we later learned out, the Minister of Defense. And uh, now uh, it, it had a pivotal moment um, with the decisions um, uh, of the Chancellor, of the, of the government of Chancellor Scholz. So, um, so there are voices in Central Europe, uh, also in the Conference on the Future of Europe, this particular exercise set up, as we see it uh, with a bit of irony, uh, uh, preliminarily for uh, Emmanuel Macron to lead his uh, successful presidential campaign, fingers crossed that he is successful, as he had another deliberative project in his first uh, presidential campaign. So there is a toolbox that in Central Eastern Europe, I guess anyone who thinks about it or discusses it must recognize it has been a French design, not bad one, but with a deliberate po political purpose to, um, uh, uh, to put more emphasis on the French presidency um, in the EU and French presidential elections at the same time of Ma Emmanuel Macron, the greatest deliberator uh, of uh, in the political class of Europeans. So, but also this comes with a degree of skepticism, of course, as to what is the nature, what's the purpose of the whole conference. As in general, Central European countries and societies are rather um, not so trusting in the political experiments uh, um, across the EU. Then they jump on board, but they're not, usually they're not first to, um, to put forward ambitious projects because the mindset um, 
in Europe is largely somewhere else. It is um, for big part of Central European uh, mindset in the in the in the perspective of security, and this is being manifested now. But in that sense, uh, we also have to see that Central Eastern European perspective is broken. It's broken preliminarily nor north and south. Not this is not an ideal division, but there is no one mindset of Central Europe. There is a mindset of Poland and the Baltics, and now also with uh, the Czechs, as we as we um, have seen over the past years, on security, on also basically coming back to Milan Kundera's understanding of not allowing Central Europe to be captured again by so, and brutalized by um, oppression from the East in whatever form it comes um, uh, from, from Moscow. And there is a group of Central Europeans who just don't care or stopped caring. And to a large extent that were um, countries uh, south, uh, that was not only Hungary with Viktor Orban, with his uh, uh, <laughs> lamentable concept of strategic uh, calmness, uh, that currently is the political marketing slogan, just to cover up uh, deficiency of uh, Hungarian democracy uh, in European, in terms of European solidarity, um, just like he, the illiberal democracy concept was just a cover up of deficiencies of democratic performance. Um, but there is also Slovakia to a large degree when it comes to society, it has not been on the same page in the perspective and an approach uh, towards the, the threats of uh, uh, Russian expansionism and revisionism for different other reasons uh, than, than Hungarians. There were also Bulgarians, there are other nations, um, not to mention Serbia here, that feel differently about what Central Europe is in the context of whole Europe. Some see it a profit and some see it as a security. And I would uh, here focus primarily on the perspective that is not of Viktor Orban, that it is that Europe is not a bank machine, as again referring to what Emmanuel Macron said, but it's largely a soft addition to the security uh, system in which we can nurture our democracies and sovereign states. The first one, and this is where Central Europe and the Visegrad group came together, is of course the NATO. NATO is considered the hard security element that all of the nations fortunately subscribed and are com committing uh, in terms of expenses to the goals set up um, by NATO of a 2% GDP for much longer time than Germany. Uh, understanding that there is a solidarity commitment in Europe necessary for the whole of Europe uh, to mitigate the risks that are coming in the, from the European neighborhood. Um, and European Union joining EU uh, was not so favorable even po in, in Poland. Um, in Poland, the referendum on the EU, you know, back in the 2004 um, was won by not such a wide margin of support. By now, Poles are super supportive of the EU as Hungarians, as a society, but the membership in the EU was uh, won in terms of political struggle, political debate and political campaigning in the moments of referendum by not so, such a big margin. This was, this, uh, this was a, a choice that was pushed partly by, by emotional sentiments of uniting Europe, but when it comes to the political and strategic decision-making of the political elites, it was uh, predominantly from the um, uh, from the the element of security that we were uh, building up. Now, from Polish perspective, of course, there is a lack of understanding why Hungary all of a sudden forgot that the the bedrock of Central Europe in the European Union is security. Um, and we can discuss later, I guess maybe we can leave it for questions and discussion, uh, the Orban Kaczynski uh, axis, but, um, but uh, I wanted to turn now to this pivotal moment that we have with the war on Ukraine, Russian war on Ukraine. Um, in the perspective of the past couple of months, since September last year, we plugged in with something that we do 
for a number of years now, which is the strategic foresight. Essentially, we add to the desk research and the analytical approach to trends and drivers of change in political um, and economic and social realm. And with the focus on democratic security, element, uh, an element of, of uh, strategic workshops, um, something that by now is becoming more and more popular also in EU policy circles. This is about uh, horizon scanning, you know, looking at a plausible scenarios, discussing them, verifying uh, plausibility, and then thinking about um, uh, how possible these scenarios, how probable these scenarios might be, and thinking of policy and, and energizing a policy discussion. Again, that fits very well our profile, and we try to step in into the discussions on the future of Europe precisely because Viktor Orban and Jarosław Kaczyński were so far the dominant parts. Actually, Polish part, not even so much in the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, they have been using the platform of the Conference on the Future of Europe as a tool to trump their ideological project that is largely disconnected from the wishes and the hopes of the population of the society. Just to illustrate that by numbers, uh, by November last year, Hungary has been the seventh biggest contributor of ideas to the Conference on the Future of Europe, counted in more than 1,000 uh, items. While among the society, nobody knew in Hungary, nobody knows the conference actually takes place. And these contributions were in the name of the civil society of, of Hungary in the process. This is to illustrate that Hungary, Hungarian leadership and also to some extent Polish leadership sees conference on the future of Europe as an element not of an honest debate in which uh, you experiment with a deliberative process, but as an element of a political game in which you push forward the agenda that is pretty much known agenda in terms of preserving nation states uh, system, limiting the powers of EU institutions, um, uh, essentially reducing the ambitions of the EU from a, norm, a Europe of norms and values to a, nor, to a Europe of uh, free market um, and uh, laissez-faire, which in consequence would be disastrous for the security element um, of why we even joined the EU in the first place. So what we did, we put forward, we uh, energized the debate across Central European civil society uh, leaders, uh, different voices participating in online and offline events to bring forward um, an upcoming report for the second part of next month, a shadow report and conference on the future of Europe with scenarios to include those scenarios that come from civil society and they are somehow uh, reserved towards the uh, the current shape of EU and those that are also more hopeful. And it seems that the main focus of those debates and, and the discussions that we have had so far have been largely around the question of enlargement and neighborhood. The question of the space uh, that is now being contested uh, or when it comes to establishing sovereign democracies and maintaining them like in Ukraine, but let's not forget Belarus and Western Balkans is very much dear to the mindset of the people in Central Eastern Europe for various reasons, partly because this is a part of our um, historical and societal experience. We don't understand why would we be excluded. It's partly, of course, like in previous expansions of the EU, partly a mercantilist approach even, because with uh, expansion, uh, you expand the markets and you limit uh, um, the barriers in trade. So you increase prosperity, but uh, predominantly this is about security, ensuring that the, the neighborhood of Europe is not a soft belly for China um, and Russia to, uh, to, infl uh, to inflict pressure points. On the, on the European uh, nations and the European Union as a whole. So there is a strong consideration on, on this point. But second to that, there is a strong discussion on uh, delivering of the promises and obligations of the EU membership. Uh, rule of law and values have been much in focus, uh, of course, among the uh, civil society. But so has been the question of Eurozone membership that in the present times, um, along the drive of Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, 
to, to go into the accession uh, moment of the EU, this is being rediscussed and reopened question. As in Poland, we have seen many former skeptics from liberal and conservative side uh, uh, showing their clear support to join Euro. In Romania, we have of official government position even that, the, uh, that Romania would join EU in 2024. So you have a momentum and, um, and an aspirational moment to, uh, to participate fully in the EU, to grasp the moment uh, that is both terrible moment and horrific from the times, uh, from the many perspective, but also an opportune moment for uh, consolidating the future of Europe. And the other thing I wanted to point out and stop uh, here is that there is a strong consideration with, um, with various uh, ambivalence on, on this global position of Europe, on the strategic autonomy of what it would be, might be, and whether it would be good for EU or not. And uh, the decisions of the EU to fund, um, to actually, um, uh, in depth itself even further and to create uh, uh, funds for uh, arms exports to Ukraine come now as much of a surprise, something unexpected, but also wished for in the previous discussions that we have had. Part of the skepticism uh, from the liberal circles, uh, liberal minded people in Central Europe towards the EU ambitions of strategic autonomy and so on where, was that it was all nice talk and then Gazprom too would sell lots of strategic asset and, and corrupt uh, the, uh, the democracy in, in Germany and influence, exercise influence you know, on, the, um, on the political making, decision making across uh, EU this way. So now we have this opportune moment that Central Europeans will still wait in a balance and see whether EU can build on this experience more of a strategic autonomy or simply lean into the effort of the US to contain the global challenge. And in that sense, I, I would like to again underline what Jacques Rupnik was saying, the challenge between democracies of the world and, uh, and those revisionist uh, autocratic powers that try to undermine the world order. Um, uh, Europe, Central Europeans definitely hope for Europe to prevail and to be stronger voice, but there is a lot of skepticism or disbelief in the ability of EU to actually deliver. And it will take not just one decision, but years of um, um, uh, integrated uh, path um, to deliver on this, on this promise. But should that be delivered, I'm personally very optimistic in, in the sense uh, that this is a, a moment in which without change of hearts, maybe of the, of the far right, you know, skeptics of, uh, or, or the ECR groups, there might be a change of mind. And that is to be discussed and that is to be seen in terms of accepting the EU integration as this element that is for real, it's for serious, and it's not for colonizing or extracting resources. Thank you, thank you, Wojtek. That's uh, that's great. Uh, it it was very important that you mentioned something we we haven't emphasized until now, among many other aspects that uh, sort of in sort of alternative views in Central Europe, the introduction of the euro where it hasn't been introduced yet, it's becoming more and more important uh, demand. Uh, as for the Hungarian opposition parties, uh, now it's one of the number one. Uh, demands uh, what what the opposition uh, is fighting for the introduction of the uh, and joining the eurozone as soon as uh, possible actually uh, what i would like to ask you we don't have too much time unfortunately but uh, when you when you somehow mapped the the ideas uh, the which are not uh, in line with, uh, with the Polish government's views. I'm asking you about uh, the Polish uh, civil society now. Uh, we have here in Hungary views which are quite popular, uh, not uh, only on the government side, but I think in more general. But Orban said that we would need a sort of buffer zone between Hungary and, uh, and Russia. And this zone is called Ukraine. 
you have do you have any such views regarding the security of our region the, from a very real politic perspective in poland that mm -hmm. uh, in that sense what orban is saying has some rationality uh, at all or or are Poles in general so anti russian in a positive sense i i would use that word now anti putin i would say that this is uh, unacceptable and also to play with uh, the sovereignty of a neighboring country, certainly. But I am, um, it's just a question for you. And maybe if you add whether you think that uh, this conflict, this war uh, would somehow, you know, undermine the friendship between Kaczynski and Orban in the longer run, or is just just a sort of a bad period for their uh, friendship, which might be based on more, you know, uh, solid grounds for the future. Mm -hmm. And then I see Georgi Kocic and she will get the floor. If, or maybe if Wojtek, if you agree, I give the floor to Georgi first and then you can react to all of the questions and that will be all of for you. Georgi, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I have two short questions. One maybe is more important than the other, but the more important one is whether um, you think uh, that, uh, uh, what do you think about the future of the Visegrad 4? Does this still exist in light of uh, what has happened in the past few weeks and whether Poland would exchange maybe uh, Hungary for Romania inside uh, the, the V4? And the other is, which is maybe a bit further away, but I, I'm still interested uh, whether you think that um, these um, geopolitical changes could somehow reintegrate the United Kingdom into Europe in some ways, because we know that the uh, Brexit is still not finished. Um, what kind of, uh, of, of uh, direction do you think is, this is going to, uh, to take? Thank you. Thank, thank you, and I guess I have three minutes to answer that. <laughs> and, uh, so I'll start, start uh, right away. Uh, a buffer zone, um, um, we, we have all read in Poland, uh, either directly or uh, a report uh, uh, about the interview of Viktor Orban from a week earlier, uh, when he, in, uh, in one of the right-wing uh, portals, he said about this equal space between uh, uh, Hungary and Russia, and that space is now uh, called Ukraine, which is, I mean, you don't have to be Polish to, to know that it is insultive, right? Um, in Poland, there is a thinking, of course, geopolitical strategic thinking also on that is not part of the popular public discourse. I can refer here to the experience of the previous president, Mr. Komorowski, who as a defense minister, uh, spoke to his German counterpart upon accepting Poland to EU and NATO. And in the light of his German counterpart, minister, uh, German Minister of Defense, Poland's accession to EU and NATO was exactly this buffer space, buffer zone, but exactly as a member of EU, as a member of NATO. So you don't have a buffer if you, if you allow and you uh, actively uh, uh, collaborate with a regime that wants to subjugate uh, an independent nation. Poland also has this deep tradition, strategic tradition, coming from the 90, uh, 1950s, from uh, the French-based, Paris-based uh, Kultura journal of uh, Jerzy Giedroyc, that uh, formed a vast array from left to right uh, of intellectuals in Poland, in the sense and that has been coined in the phrase that Poles Czechs, Czechoslovaks then, uh, Hungarians cannot be free until Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and also Russians are free of the imperial uh, threat of, uh, of Moscow. So until these nations are truly democratic and free of dependencies of, again, referring to Milan Kundera's essay, the kind of dependencies that Czech, uh, from the Czech perspective, was considered uh, a captured um, captured, hijacked uh, Europe. 
so um, that on the buffer zone, uh, we read it as a false statement, as deeply insultive, and it has no grounding. This is not real politic. This is simply translating Dugin into Hungarian. Uh, for the second point, uh, the, the friendship. Uh, Kaczynski apparently does believe he, they are friends. He has an emotional, he has been sending um, symptoms that they are friends. But now uh, the important thing has happened. In 2014, Orange Revolution was already making a rift between Orban and Kaczynski. Kaczynski was openly dissatisfied with Orban's position. Now, there, were two, there, were, there was this moment in which Kaczynski went to uh, Kiev, regardless of the efficiency of this position in terms of help to Ukraine, largely symbolic gesture, and fortunately they came back safe. But what happened there was uh, putting a geographical distance of, 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 of a great magnitude between the Polish leadership and Orban, as he on the same day said he knew about the trip and he wouldn't come. Right. So this is, I think, an important um, a moment, not just symbolically, but also uh, from the point of view of the question number three, also what sort of friendships are there in V4? And currently, uh, Mr. Kaczynski spent uh, some 20 hours or more on the train with uh, two politicians who are of different mindset and used to be urban allies both Mr. Jansha, not my favorite, but he is uh, the president, uh, prime minister of Slovenia, and he's fighting for re-election. Actually, it was apparently his idea to go. But more importantly, Mr. Fiala of the European Conservative um, Group in the European Parliament, prime minister of Czech Republic. And here comes the answer to the third question. Uh, Visegrad has not been well functioning, functioning well when there was some illusionary partnership between Poland and Hungary. For strategic reasons, we do not share common interests, except for our society to society links and hopes for bettering our relationship in terms of civil society, economy. We have opposite uh, national interests as they are currently defined. This comes with dependency on uh, energy sources. This comes with uh, some elements of not accepting as I just pointed out in Jerzy Giedroyc's uh, think, strategic thinking about the neighborhood, what constitutes a safe and secure um, uh, Hungary. It does not, Hungary does not say it in so loud, you know, so loudly as Poland about the former lands and societies that are living there, that they are not just have the right to be established there, but we fully support their all uh, um, democratic moment to claim those lands, to claim the cultural heritage and to build up democratic states. This is completely different. And that uh, moment here is understood much more uh, or has some resonance more with the Czech Republic and Czech perspective. Mr. Fiala represents a government that already the, the, the term before was different government, was uh, strongly positioning from starting from Senate, starting from uh, the mayors in, in Czech against uh, Russian uh, revisionist and authoritarian uh, practices, also Chinese. So in these terms, in security and strategic terms, also Mr. Fiala spent these crucial moments in the train with Mr. Kaczynski that puts a big distance in practical terms. And I hope, I just don't know, but I hope that both Mr. Morawiecki, who is known not to be a very big friend of Mr. Orban, uh, used this time well, and Mr. Fiala was also not coming empty-handed in that sort of strategic alignment. That is, this is just my speculative uh, hope, but I do believe that there is something um, at play. And finally, UK, yes, I would, I would definitely like to see that, um, but I don't see how a conservative uh, government uh, that currently does what it has to do, it's in the strategic, again, interests of, of Great Britain, uh, is really um, doing, um, making a change against Brexit unless they really uh, take control of the properties of the Russian districts in London, and uh, they finally get rid of the uh, corruption that has been uh, you know, largely undermining 
their political elites, uh, especially in the Conservative Party. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Wojtek, for all your answers. And I think it's very important to speculate sometimes about the future. We just learned how much uh, experts uh, relying on so-called uh, uh, real politique and, and facts might misunderstand the situation as we know that there were very few who could foresee what <clears throat> happened just recently. And the real intentions of Vladimir Putin were also misunderstood so many by so many experts. And it happened many times before in our history regarding our own regime change in 1989 and around that uh, so many people uh, had uh, even experts did not see it. So I agree with you that we need speculations, especially when we don't have enough information. And it's very encouraging in a way to thinking ahead that maybe what's going on right now uh, might help in a way to change uh, at least Polish politics. And um, you mentioned, we talked about the government, but we should also mention that Donald Tusk was here in Budapest and uh, he is still a leading figure in the center right at European level. And maybe the new uh, Hungarian uh, uh, political leader on, of the opposition, Peter Markizai, might, might have a party sooner or later and will join the European center right. Uh, and that might also change in a bit the political landscape uh, of the future. So anyway, thank you very much for your contribution. It was great to have you with us and please stay with us if you have more time. And now I would like to give the floor to our last speaker in the morning, who is also a relatively old friend of our Hungarian Europe Society by now, uh, Richard Youngs, who is uh, uh, originally British actually, but he comes from uh, Brussels and he is a senior fellow in, in democracy, conflict and government pro governance program at Carnegie Europe in, in Brussels. And uh, Richard's role, what I asked him to do would be to speak once again about the conference on the future of the European Union, but very much from the perspective of the civil society and uh, whether this uh, big exercise actually gave a momentum for a more democratic participation of the citizens, uh, what uh, Wojciech already spoke about, but in a sense that uh, these new procedures and uh, and uh, opportunities to participate and to influence the future of our continent, whether it works, whether it's efficient, or it's more lip service for civil society members. So I would be very happy to have your views, Richard, and thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. No, th really, thanks from my uh, side, uh, Istvan. Thanks very much for the invitation and for being included. It's a pleasure to follow on, as always, from uh, Wojciech. Uh, um, actually, uh, many of my points will fit nicely with uh, some of his arguments. So Isvan asked me to focus in quite narrowly on this topic of the Conference on the Future of Europe, and in particular, the role of citizen participation in the conference. I think my headline conclusion to your question, Isvan, would be that there is some real momentum in the conference in favour of citizen participation. Uh, but I'm not sure it's enough momentum to be a real game changer for European democracy. So I'm happy in my, my few words here to stick uh, rigidly to this narrow issue of the conference itself. But I would point out that I think the real important and dynamic action of democratic renewal that's most likely to affect Hungary and other countries is actually taking place outside the conference. So my argument would be that actually the conference has, in a way, against odds, built up quite a lot of positive potential for citizen participation, but I still think the real key will be whether it can act as a kind of broader catalyst for other forms of democratic reform uh, across Europe. So in a way, my reply would be kind of half positive to your to the question you said me, um, uh, Istvan. I think um, it, the conference has uh, been quite a success so far in uh, structuring some really dynamic citizen participation and deliberation. It's worth reminding ourselves that at the beginning, many uh, observers, many governments were very skeptical that this could happen at all. 
the institution spent many, many months fighting over who should be in control of the conference. Uh, and this appeared to be to the detriment of any prospect of citizens uh, being deeply involved. Initially, member states, the council, um, set quite a restrictive uh, mandate that would really reduce citizens' involvement to something very symbolic and cosmetic. So the conference had quite bad beginnings, not very auspicious beginnings. Uh, and in this sense, what has actually happened since the conference opened, I think, has been much more positive in terms of generating real citizen interest and participation than many people initially um, expected. Probably people on the call um, have been following this in detail. I see uh, Susanna's here and I know she's been following this. Uh, there's been the, the, the panels involving hundreds of citizens looking at foreign policy, economic policy, climate policy and the institutional structure um, of the EU. They've come up with some really good recommendations. Uh, their deliberations attracted a lot of attention. Many of their debates were, were well structured. They were taken through to actual concrete votes. So quite an interesting and uh, deep uh, seated experiment uh, experience in uh, democratic uh, deliberation. Um, uh, many people from all walks of life, the, the, the methodology of selecting these people was quite sophisticated. So really it, uh, it, has been, it has been an experience that has engaged people who previously did not have the chance or the interest in being engaged in debates over, over the future of the European Union. You all know this, that there's a digital platform being set, uh, being set up as well. This has attracted several thousand people. Um, contributions that's generated quite an open-ended debate in contrast to the way the European Commission normally sets up these consultations um, the agenda was left fairly open normally the, the, it's the European Commission that sets the agenda and asks citizens to respond to Commission proposals that are already in the pipeline this debate was far more um, open-ended and uh, supporters would say it's generated quite a lot of extra interest and participation from people who previously just weren't interested in these issues. Also, uh, initially, uh, uh, organized civil society was not included in the remit of the conference. Uh, now it is, so it also has a role uh, at the table. So in, in the, the momentum is there, Istvan. Um, I think uh, you're right in that, and it's quite uh, promising. There are still doubts, there are still skeptics um, amongst people who run deliberative uh, exercises. I'm not one of them, I don't run these exercises for a living, but those who do and get really into the detailed methodology of these kinds of exercises uh, have been critical. So there are methodological doubts expressed by many people that the panels were too large, their, their agendas, their mandates were too broad, it was not made clear to citizens exactly what would happen to their recommendations. Um, it didn't really um, do enough to uh, specifically include previously unengaged uh, parts of the population. So th there are doubts there. We should be aware of um, those amongst the people who actually live by designing this kind of methodology. These are very, very micro issues, but uh, it seems to me that even if, even if there are some of those methodological doubts there, uh, this is an unprecedented exercise in including citizens. It has generated a lot of momentum in favor of uh, thinking longer term about how citizens should be involved in European Union debates. Let's not forget this was the first time these kinds of deliberative panels have been exercised across national borders. It's quite easy to, ex to um, organize these kinds of uh, exercises, say, in one city. But when one is organizing these on a pan-European basis, the logistics are a lot more uh, complicated. So it's probably not surprising that there are a few teething difficulties in these first transnational pan-European uh, paddles. I think given that they've actually worked uh, very well and they have uh, built up a lot of uh, momentum behind the idea of citizen participation. I think everyone here will be aware that now is the kind of uh, key moment, the key test moment, the crunch moment, that all these recommendations from the citizens are being fed into the, the conferences plenary. It's not clear what will happen to these recommendations. Uh, governments, EU institutions didn't really define the, the processes of what will go on 
in the conference's plenary. It is clearly not the case that all the citizen recommendations are going automatically to make it onto the, the final uh, conference uh, conclusions. It's got to, they've got to go through several filters, an executive board, then the governments, the member states. So, so it will not be the case that all the recommendations find their way into concrete policy proposals. But it does seem to me that governments are and the institutions are taking citizens' ideas seriously, far more seriously than they did in previous uh, intergovernmental conferences and similar um, exercises. This has raised expectations of what will happen in the future. Uh, I think this is the really interesting dimension here. There was a fear that this would just be a one-off exercise. When the conference finished, that would be it, and nobody would think any more about citizen participation. It does look now as if um, there are uh, ideas being taken seriously to make sure that these forms of citizen participation do exist over the longer term. Citizens themselves have asked for some kind of permanent assembly, permanent citizen forums to be set up after the conference finishes. If that's the case, then it seems to me that would be a really qualitative step forward. If it's not just an exercise under the remit of the conference itself, but something that becomes a more structural improvement to European to democracy at the European level. Uh, and it looks as if the digital platform will be uh, kept open in some form as well. So I think in all that sense, this is important. Um, there's still uh, details to be ironed out about where a permanent citizen assembly would actually be positioned. There's debates about whether it would be located within the European Parliament and citizens would play a kind of monitoring role over what governments um, actually followed through on in terms of their commitments in the conference. Other people would say that citizens should be involved more at the technical level of actually providing specific recommendations within different uh, policy sectors. So a lot still uh, to be debated. My fear, that's all on the positive side. To conclude and just put a few issues uh, for questions for debate, Istvan, I would say, the, I think the fear is that um, this is all extremely positive and a lot of, um, uh, raises a lot of positive potential. I think the danger is that um, rather too much is being expected of uh, these citizen panels um, and of uh, a, a possible permanent uh, citizen assembly uh, that would be set up after the conference. Citizens have been included, this is very positive, but we shouldn't forget that while the conference has been going on, all this year's democracy indices have come out and told us that the, that the trajectory of European democracy is still getting worse, not better. So I think one does fear that governments will use this exercise of citizen participation to say they've kind of they've ticked the democracy box. They're listening to citizens, whereas, in fact, the broader structural problems of, de of democracy um, uh, across Europe are actually getting worse, uh, not better. So I think we have to set our expectations at a realistic uh, level. We also have to bear in mind something Wojciech was responding to that if the conference does agree on quite significant steps forward uh, on particular policies, uh, the euro, economics, uh, climate, now on foreign policy, security policy, because of the invasion, I still think the democratic element of the EU is not keeping pace with these policy developments. Everyone on the call will know the EU is often criticized for having policy without politics, is the phrase that's normally quoted. Uh, for developing uh, uh, areas of policy integration that we may all agree with and think are necessary, but in a way that doesn't have um, adequate democratic accountability attached to it. If the conference does see significant steps forward in integration, in particular policy areas, simply having one or two citizen panels doesn't seem to me sufficient for there to be formal mechanisms of democratic accountability that are of the same magnitude or that are commensurate with those steps forward in policy development. So I think the danger is the conference will still conclude with this gap between policy and politics being wider than it was when the conference uh, opened. So it seems to me that in concluding, concluding word here, I would say that this is all positive, but the next step forward has to be how this uh, 
very promising exercise in citizen participation in the conference can act as a kind of catalyst to generate a broader momentum of reform that would be more uh, directly tangible and relevant to a country like uh, Hungary, how it can open the door to other forms of um, interesting ideas for democratic uh, renovation, how we can move from a situation where still a relatively small number of citizens have been involved in the conference to um, a larger number of citizens being involved far more actively in debates about European democracy. How can one maybe bring in crowdsourcing of um, legislative ideas at the EU level, um, how one can use EU-wide referendum a bit more uh, constructively th than before. And again, relating to something Wojciech was talking about, how uh, one can ensure organized civil society is far more um, actively and dynamically involved and can act as a kind of bridge between the individual citizens and the formal EU institutions. I think that area um, is still being unduly excluded from the debate so far of what's been going on uh, in the conference. So I think I'll finish there. It's found basically a kind of half positive answer. I think the, gen the momentum that has been generated in terms of citizens' involvement is more significant than many people expected at the beginning. But we should not think that this is sufficient for being a real game changer in terms of democratic momentum in Europe. It's a very modest first step. And I think the really important thing is to bear in mind that it is just a first step. And it's in the period after the conference closes that European governments will really need to show their commitment to democracy to harnessing this momentum rather than thinking the conference finishes and then we go back to business as usual yeah well thank you very much uh, richard that that uh, really made uh, i think the picture much more clear what's going on and uh, and what we can expect from from that uh, conference and all the positive and negative sides uh, are very important what uh, what you mentioned uh, but I would like to ask you whether you mentioned that we don't know how it's, it's going on, what will happen next and what the governments are going to do. We have read, maybe many of you read that now there are issues like uh, treaty change also on, on the floor that maybe it can conclude to another big convention and then now with participants from governments and civil society and institutions just like it happened uh, some 15 years ago, maybe when the constitution was supposed to, to formulate and then we had the Lisbon Treaty. So that might be one outcome. So I would like to ask you whether was it until now uh, cacophonic in a way what was heard regarding the content of the proposals or do we have a sort of ideological tendency, more liberal minded proposals from participants, or was the top was the, the whole uh, exercise partly hijacked like Wojciech mentioned by the Hungarian government at least. So how do you evaluate the content and in that sense, the future of this experiment? So I, I agree with Wojciech actually on this. I think um, it has been a little bit of a cacophony, but there are lots of really good recommendations. I mean, if one, if you read through that, they're very detailed. Citizens have got into the, the fine grain of um, EU debates and they've come up with a, a lot of really kind of innovative uh, thoughts and ideas. But um, I think uh, Wojciech is right that the danger is that governments instrumentalize the process of citizen engagement. Um, and I think that that is a danger that all the governments have their predetermined policy goals for the conference. And then the citizen participation is kind of framed as being potentially useful as a way of giving legitimacy to those uh, national goals that are already decided. I think that would do a disservice to democratic reform in Europe. Uh, it seems to me that the equation needs to be the other way around. The, the primary goal should be to think about how we generate more democratic participation and accountability, more meaningful democratic uh, involvement and renovation. And that then if there is to be deeper European integration, that should be the result of this better quality democracy rather than the other way around. 
rather than starting from a particular European agenda and then kind of adding on or bolting on uh, some uh, kind of set piece elements of democratic participation to the standard set of uh, national governments, European goals. I would start from democracy and build European on integration on the basis of that rather than the other way around. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask the audience where anybody would like to raise a question or have a comment. We have a couple of more minutes until uh, half past uh, 12. We haven't run out of time. So yes, Zsuzsa Salini, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank, th thank you, everyone. It was really a, a fantastic session from uh, uh, Jacques Rupnik until Richards. And my question is actually to more of you. So, because, um, um, and also I'd like to put this, this question in this, this, the recent couple of weeks uh, discourse on the war and how it has changed um, um, the perception of, of Europe and also the projections of the future of Europe. And many of you talked about the, the possible um, moments of, of uh, perceiving security and unity as the key raison d'etre uh, of the EU for the future, something, a momentum which which uh, can really play to and push forward um, the, the integration of the EU and hopefully also democratization or democratic revival in the European Union. So I, I'd like to ask uh, you and also, um, uh, <coughs> so beyond Richards, I also would like to, to ask Wojciech uh, and, well, if if so, what what's there? Is there any perspective in relationship with this? Is this newly um, uh, perceived need for security, especially in this region, but also all around Europe, and the reinforcement of 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 democracy? Is this because that's not such a self evident issue? But obviously, if we want to push this agenda, then then there is a perspective in, in, into my mind, but is, is there in the narratives, is there, is there in the discourse, do you have, do you see the potential of this? Okay, um, we have not much time. So, and uh, uh, I would like to start with Richard and Wojciech. I think Jacques is still here. I'm not sure about Lynn, but if all of you would have uh, one or two minutes, uh, that, that would be great. So Richard, please. Uh, so I agree. I think uh, one can already see this in some of the citizen discussions that the, uh, the security dimension is, is becoming more prominent. And I think the invasion will act as a prompt for deeper cooperation in European security. Uh, this isn't completely new. For the last uh, three or four years, the focus on security in the EU has already been gaining a lot of momentum. It's probably been one of the areas uh, that has, has generated most momentum in recent years under the European Defence Fund, the PESCO um, initiative. So a lot has already been going on to complement NATO's role. And I think that's likely to, to move a step further. I think my slightly more sceptical take to so would be that whether that is, is fully compatible with the democracy agenda. Um, we, we may all agree that the security dimension is going to be more necessary, but I think some care will be needed that the EU then doesn't become kind of too securitized um, and the democracy agenda gets a little bit uh, pushed off the agenda. I think it is the case citizens will now look to the EU to be more of a security provider. So that security, that strategic dimension will have more uh, democratic legitimacy, but there may be a slight danger that we, de we then revert to this very kind of standard top-down policymaking method in the EU because the strategic imperatives are so important now, and the the element of 
citizen participation may look very minimal, may look a very kind of niche area now that's not really important. And that would be a shame because it repeats a pattern where the EU often commits to bringing citizens more systematically into EU debates. And then a crisis comes along, the financial crisis, COVID, now, now the invasion, and then all, all, all this, um, these ideas of more bottom-up and inclusive policymaking then just get forgotten. Yeah, that's that's certainly a danger. Uh, Wojciech, the floor is yours. I, I think it, it touches about a, a very important element of the, the civil society and security. In Poland, most of the civil society or society overall did not feel secure, uh, you know, that they were taken care of. There was this moment of mo emotion, of solidarity that people expressed largely also driven by Ukrainian diaspora in Poland. But that was so similar to Polish uh, participants driving the aid to refugees that it quickly grew to, you know, like everybody's helping, everybody's hosting someone, everybody's, I don't know, donating and things like that. And I think there is an important moment where, where the Polish government narrative and this kind of top-down centralized approach fighting, you know, illiberal fight against the grassroots also against autonomy, against uh, local movement, decentralization is now facing a real dilemma because the government cannot deliver on more of security. It is not the government that did any of the support uh, immediately to the refugees and the civil society got mobilized. Now, depending, depending on how well the opposition is able to use that, this may be a pivotal moment in Polish politics. Of course, the government can, comes in, uh, in aid in different forms, but the aid is limited also until at least they make peace with the European Commission over EU funds. So now you can get 10 euro per day in translating in it to real terms for hosting a, a, a refugee instead of what could have been 25. And this is already a popular discourse in, uh, in translating into, again, a very uh, you know, monetary um, ways. But there is another dilemma or the, the dimension of it, not dilemma, the dimension of it, which is uh, those who were most mobilized and active in a Polish society, in civil society activity. And there, it's, it's disorganized, it's, it's a mess, it's, it's terrible waste of energy and efforts also, but there is this great mobilization and help that is driven primarily by the people and around the people who are already active and mobilized in defense of the rule of law. As you remember, maybe from the previous years, there was quite an impressive and stunning, uh, surprising uh, movement to defend the courts. I mean, who in name of God would go up to the street and defend those bloody, you know, uh, nose ups in the courts? I mean, the, 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 nobody likes judges. Uh, but still, uh, they, this, uh, this is a very uh, important thing I would not overlook, still yet to be examined, what comes out of it, because definitely there is a moment that does not divert attention from the rule of law and civil society and good governance in Poland, but there is an, a moment that just mobilizes and amplifies and multiplies uh, perhaps the effect of people you know, being engaged and doing something and actually looking for more EU um, and less of a nationalistic agenda. Yeah, thank you. That's that's very significant point you mentioned. I think that even in the longer run, uh, societal change might uh, be influenced by, by the refugee uh, wave uh, now coming from a different uh, country and maybe it, it, the, the reaction of the Polish and the Hungarian uh, citizens are so different. What uh, Jacques mentioned at the very beginning that compared to the 2015 uh, refugee crisis, which is not positive at all. But on the other hand, you're right that the rule of law issue with all these NGOs efforts and, and people coming from a neighboring country because of need that might create a different situation, maybe in the long run, for our political societies, uh, let's let's hope so. Uh, now I cannot see Lynn anymore, but she was uh, a little bit sick, so I think she left. But Chuck, you are still with us, so the floor is yours. 
Are you here? Can you hear us or you left? I, I can hear. I, I, yeah. I hope I'm heard as well. Yes. I, I spoke uh, too long this morning, so I don't want to uh, take too much of your time. But I, I only agree. I very much agree with what uh, has been said by by the two uh, previous speakers. All I could add is that suddenly this old dichotomy, you know, we have domestic politics and that is democracy. And then there is something over there and that's the European Union, and this is where they bargain about uh, uh, economic issues, uh, I don't know, subsidies and, and things like that. And uh, uh, suddenly, I think in, in crisis situations like the one we are experiencing, there is war on our doorstep. There is migrant, there's a huge refugee crisis of an unprecedented uh, 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 magnitude. Uh, there is the... Um, suddenly uh, the, the, the question of energy supply, gas, etc. These are very concrete issues. This is not a, a theoretical academic debate about uh, 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 energy security or something like that. No, this is, you know, you close the tap or you open the tap. You have no stream two or you don't have it. <laughs> you have no stream one, what, uh, you know, and those who advocate, you know, let's cut it all, you know, no gas, no oil, well, uh, what are the consequences? So suddenly all these issues that were disconnected, uh, democracy as a domestic nation state issue and various economic uh, uh, transactional matters are left to the, suddenly they are becoming reconnected. So EU uh, has become, I, mean, I can see it in the in the French uh, election campaign, but, uh, but, but, it, but it's, uh, I, I think, true as well all becomes directly connected. You want to discuss uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the demands that you hear from politicians in the French election campaign. The state should compensate for increase in gas prices or what have you, or EU should compensate or who somebody should compensate for, <laughs> you know, Putin should compensate. Yeah, um, no, so, uh, any debate you take on those issues, migration, uh, borders, uh, energy, including more explicitly security issue, are becoming European and domestic issues intertwined. So that, that I think is, is a new moment. And of course, the crisis for the, the, and the war on the doorstep, the migrant crisis, acts as a catalyst of that. Uh, so in my in my introduction, I spoke about the way it's changing the debate within Europe, you know, with the Central European countries, but it changes the debate also domestically in each of the member state countries. And we, we heard a German uh, colleague speaking uh, uh, before. It's affect clearly Germany has been affected and everybody has spoken about the fun amazing turnaround in Germany's thinking about security. But that's done with the consent of a democratically elected parliament with a new government that has a democratic mandate. And that is, you know, suddenly you have SPD and Green talking about supplying weapons. Wow, you know, so, but <laughs> that, that is a complete change in the security culture but that's taking place within a democratic framework, within a democratic debate, and in dialogue with a democratically elected parliament, and with a broader debate in society. And something similar is happening in France. And as I said, the, the, those who gave a sort of benefit of the doubt to Putin on security are, are, are being sort of deflated or marginalized, and, and Macron's uh, unabashed pro-European stance uh, is vindicated because of what I've just said, that suddenly people for the first time can see in quite a tangible way how, you know, migrant issue, energy issue, security issue are being intertwined with, uh, with the domestic politics. Yeah, thank you very much. And yes, of course, uh, everything gets uh, interlinked now policy issues with high politics and international politics with domestic politics and um, all of our domestic 
politics have been Europeanized uh, in the last years, and it happens right now even more at this uh, very moment. In some countries, in a democratic uh, culture, which uh, kept its uh, traditions like uh, Germany. In our case, in Hungary, in a much more polarized political situation. But issues like whether we need a second nuclear plant uh, supported by, uh, by the Russian government using Russian laws, that's an issue and even more than before. So yes, everything has been interlinked uh, recently. And uh, it, it, these are the voters uh, who would decide, at least in, uh, in the French and the Hungarian cases uh, in the following uh, days and weeks. Uh, well, I would like to thank all of you. I think we had a great morning. Now it's uh, uh, half past 12, so it's already afternoon. And we will have a break uh, until two o'clock. Uh, I hope most of you will come back who cannot thanks for your participation but everybody else is welcome and please come back 10 minutes before two to make the necessary connection to our zoom platform and we will continue i hope with very exciting uh, uh, discussions and presentations in two more sessions until six o'clock uh, in the evening you are all welcome thank you and see you all very soon bye-bye